Welcome to the first presentation of the 2020 Virtual FOP Family Gathering. I could not be more proud to introduce Dr. Fred Kaplan. I'm sure many of you have already been in communication with Dr. Kaplan at one point in your FOP journey. But for those of you who have not had the great gift of knowing him, Dr. Kaplan co-directs co -directs the Center for Research in FOP and Related Disorders at the University of Pennsylvania. He is recognized as the world's leading ex expert on genetic disorders of heterotopic ossification. Dr. Kaplan has dedicated his life to serving the FOP community, both here in the United States and internationally. We are eternally, great, eternally grateful to Dr. Kaplan for the impact he has had on both FOP research and care. He has been joining the IFOPA at family gatherings such as this since 1991. While many things may look a little different this year, like the steady guiding force he is, Dr. Kaplan is here to help us welcome you with his special insight and his commitment to supporting FOP families. Over to you, Dr. Kaplan. Thank you very much, Hope. I wish we could all be together. I hope we can be together next year. I'd like to see everybody and renew our, our friendships. Uh, there is much exciting research being conducted at our center and at laboratories around the world. My goal today is not to discuss the entire universe of promising projects, but to provide a new grammar for understanding the treatment horizons, which center squarely and unmistakably on the FOB gene, and to set the stage for the gateway of hope to which we all aspired. These are, of course, heralded by clinical trials. The title for my presentation today is The Leaky Faucet, and I think you'll see that in a few minutes. Uh, it's a metaphor uh, that we're going to use to describe the new grammar for drug discovery for FOP. From the very beginning of our work back in the early 1980s, uh, we established what was the mission of FOP. It's very simple, and it's the mission today. It's to determine the cause of FOP at a genetic, molecular, cellular, tissue level, uh, and to use that knowledge, not just to discover it, but to use that knowledge to develop better treatments and eventually a cure for FOP. For many years, I ended my presentation with the discovery of the FOP gene. Uh, it gives me great pleasure today to, to really start the presentation with that, uh, with that slide uh, because that is the center, central cause of FOP. And it was discovered back in 2006 in our laboratory uh, and by collaborators and with collaborators from around the world. Uh, pictured here shows Mei Chi Su, one of our senior scientists who was first to see the FOP gene. And it's ACBR1, Activin Receptor 1A. And it's one misspelled letter in six billion that causes FOP. That's the common cause of FOP in 97% of individuals who have FOP from around the world. One misspelled letter in six billion in our, in our uh, genetic alphabet that's included in every cell in the body. And in 2006, we published the paper, a recurrent mutation in BMP type 1 receptor ACBR1 causes inherited and sporadic fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva. In the following week, the journal Science reported that the bone disease gene was finally found. And as I've said before, it took, a, it took more than a village. It took a worldwide community to find this gene. And uh, it took many, many years to do so. Now, with the technology, it would take a, a, a bit shorter period of time. Um, but, uh, but having built having built this community and having this community grow up, both from Penn and from the IFOPA over time, we now have a worldwide community that includes over 32 laboratories that are investigating FOP including many biopharmaceutical companies that are investigating FOP. So where we were the uh, sole contributor to FOP many years ago, uh, we're not so now. 
and uh, that is a great, great uh, advancement because uh, this is now a worldwide enterprise. Several weeks after the gene was discovered, the New York Times published in its health science page the, um, the article uh, that features Hayden Fife here, uh, my, one of my patients from Sausalito, California, a patient of also uh, Ed, Ed Chow's. It, in, the, in the New York Times uh, headlines really emblemizes and heralds the, uh, the passion and the feeling that we all uh, come to uh, feel with FOP. It's finally, it's a sense of hope. Finally, with genetic discovery, hope, hope for escape from a prison of bone. And Hayden lives uh, in Sausalito in Mill Valley, California, which is uh, near uh, Sausalito and looks over the San Francisco Bay and sees Alcatraz. And Hayden said to me one day, he said, I hope we, I hope we can uh, find a treatment that um, frees me from this prison of bone, much like the prisoners at Alcatraz. The FOB gene is not only a powerful drug for does, drug discovery, it is in fact the bullseye of the target, and it, it establishes the entire grammar for drug discovery for FOP. It's the center of the bullseye. And this graph shows on the x-axis, it shows years. On the y-axis, it shows number of, of uh, pharmaceutical and biotech uh, companies interested in FOP. And you see that there was some interest uh, prior to 2006. But when the gene discovery, there was a meteoric and astronomical rise in the interest of the pharmaceutical and biotechnology company. And the reason for that is that the FOP gene is not just the center of the, of the, uh, uh, of the target, but it establishes the entire grammar for drug discovery for FOP. So everything is either on stream, upstream, downstream, or side stream of that target, as we'll see in a moment. Well, soon after we discovered the FOB gene, we had to uh, establish that this was not just the genetic cause, but it actually caused FOP. And that was done by my colleague, uh, Dr. Eileen Shore. And uh, she took the one genetic letter that was misspelled in 97% uh, of individuals with FOP and uh, basically implanted that into a mouse uh, genome at the same locus, at the same site in the ACBR1 gene. Um, and she established a, uh, a mouse that had FOP. And in fact, it did have FOP. You can see here that the uh, uh, in the toe, in the normal mouse, in the control mouse, the toes are normal. In the FOP mouse, the toes are shorter. And the mouse had abnormalities in the skeleton, like we see with FOP, not just the toes, but also the, the cervical spine. So here on the right, we see a column of uh, human findings with FOP, and here we see a column with mouse findings of FOP. And you can see that the cervical vertebra uh, are not formed properly, that they, um, that their malformations there in the facet joints and the neck doesn't extend properly, uh, as we see in FOP patients. Uh, we see, also see where the ribs join the spine and that there are abnormalities in the costovertebral joints uh, and there are osteochondromas, these bone cartilage benign uh, lesions uh, they're not FOP lesions themselves, but they're bone cartilage, and they grow outside, uh, out of the normal bone. They're not in the muscle, but they grow out of the normal bone. And these are seen in patients with FOP, and they're also seen in mice with FOP. On the next slide, we see that when we inject and we injure a muscle in this mouse uh, around the knee. Um, we don't just get a response to heal the muscle, we get heterotopic bone. And it forms by the same pathway, the same what we call endochondral pathway, a cartilage to bone pathway that we see in all individuals with FOP. And we, we learned this over the years from biopsies, unfortunately, that have been done, but that we retrieved from patients uh, who had who have FOP, and we looked at them under the microscope, 
and this mouse established the same pattern. So we now not only establish that this is the genetic cause, but this one single letter mutation, one letter out of six billion actually causes the FOP. And this provided us with an animal model that we could then use to uh, develop other models that can be used to test uh, various candidates for FOP. As soon as we discovered uh, the FOP gene, it became very clear that uh, this pathway, this genetic pathway, was responsible. So we now not only had the genetic cause of FOP, we had a um, we had a model to test, and this actually proved this work from Dr. Shore and the laboratory proved that ACBR1 or the uh, R20, what we call the R206 mutation, that single letter that's misspelled in position 206, amino acid 206. We have a histidine a, uh, represented by an H substitu uh, substituted instead of an arginine, which is an R. And that is responsible for the extra bone formation, for the great toe malformations, for the endochondral bone formation, and for the pattern formations of the uh, bone that we see in FOP. And so this established that this was, in fact, the cause of FOP. So now I would like to uh, use a metaphor to explain the grammar of uh, drug discovery that I uh, have alluded to all along. The ACBR1 gene is an instruction. It's a DNA instruction for, uh, uh, for making uh, the ACBR1 protein. We all have two copies of that. Healthy individuals have two copies of the ACBR1 uh, protein made by the ACBR1 gene. Uh, when one copy of the gene comes from the father, one copy comes from the mother, and there's a spontaneous mutation in one of those two copies. We don't know which one uh, in most individuals who have FOP. Uh, and in a, in a healthy individual, uh, the uh, genetic machinery makes two normal faucets. Let's, the ACBR1 protein is a receptor. It sits on the cell membrane. It, a ligand, a hormone-like molecule binds to it, and it sends signals into the cell. It's sort of like a faucet um, that has to be turned on and turned off. And a healthy individual makes two copies of the normal faucet. An FOP a patient makes one copy of the normal faucet and one copy of an FOP faucet damaged by just that one letter. And that one letter... Oops, let me go back to a previous slide. And that one letter uh, causes, um, causes an abnormality. So in, in a normal faucet, the faucet should be off. The, it's, the faucet is a metaphor for the FOP gene or the FOP protein made by the FOP gene. And in a normal faucet, the faucet should be off when it's off, and it's turned on by the bone morphogenetic proteins, and it causes what we have here, PSMAD15. That's just a, a fancy word. It's a, a, it's, um, it's a signal. It's a, another protein that is part of a molecular relay race that conveys a signal to the cell inside the body, uh, inside the cell, to become, a, to become a bone rather than uh, repair as a muscle. In a, in a normal faucet, uh, the faucet should be off. The BMPs turn this faucet on, and uh, a signal comes out to make, uh, to make bone. When you want to make bone, you turn the faucet on. When you don't want to make bone, you keep the faucet off. In an FOP faucet, the faucet is leaky all the time. So uh, water comes out of the faucet even when it's not turned on. And the, when the BMPs turn the faucet on, it explodes with activity. Water comes out. And we now feel, we'll see in a, in a, in a slide soon, that this uh, drippy, drippy, drippy nature of the faucet causes the congenital features of FOB, not just the toe malformation, but other malformations of the skeleton. And the uh, turning on of the faucet by BMPs and perhaps other molecules that we'll see soon uh, causes this faucet to explode, and that sends a signal for bone to form.
it's sort of emblematic here of the uh, faucet. We have a drippy faucet, and that causes the uh, congenital features of FOP, the features that we see before birth that are laid down. So too much of this bone forming protein by the drippy faucet uh, before birth causes the joints not to form properly. Too much after birth causes too much bone to form, heterotopic bone. And we see this in a uh, rather elaborate cartoon, uh, high powered molecular cartoon of the ACVR1 gene and all the machinery necessary. The ACVR1 protein is circled in green and there are various ligands that, uh, that bind to the receptor. But in, in FOP, because of the single, mal single misspelled letter, we have a leaky faucet uh, prenatally and a BMP dependent faucet uh, after birth. It causes the bone, the, uh, bone formation to, uh, to explode. And here we see a portion of the ACVR1 faucet. This is a normal faucet where we have arginine in position 202 and in position 206. This is an FOP faucet. And we see arginine is still in position 202, but histidine is substituted in position 206. And this now becomes open. This is a closed, uh, a closed circle here uh, as, it's, as it's depicted. And this allows a protein called FKBP12 to bind to keep that faucet off and non-leaky when the faucet is not turned on. Unfortunately, uh, it's, like, it's, it's like a washer. And uh, this FKBP12 is like a washer. And this is a broken faucet here. This is where the FOP faucet is broken. And it doesn't allow that, wa wa that washer to function properly. And it allows uh, leakiness of the faucet when it should be off and explosion of the faucet when it's turned on. So this is, this is the action part of the, uh, of, of, the, um, of the faucet. And this is really responsible for FOP. And in this cartoon, we see the leaky faucet, not just responsible for the great toe malformation, but for thumb malformations in about 50% of individuals. For cervical spine malformations, uh, in the facet joints where the neck eye uh, extends. Uh, many children don't, are not able to extend their neck and they crawl uh, and they uh, scoot around on their butt before they crawl. Uh, most importantly, uh, it, the uh, drippy faucet interferes with the formation of what we call the costo vertebral joints. That's where the ribs join the spine. And we can see that here. Each rib uh, forms three articulations with the spine the vertebra above, the vertebra below, and the transverse process. Uh, we have 12 ribs on each side, so 12 times 3 is 36. We have two sides, so that's 72. So 72 joints in the body uh, are responsible. And if there's any asymmetry in the formation of those joints, that can lead to scoliosis early on, uh, spinal deformity, and uh, aside from heterotopic bone formation, can lead to extraordinary amounts of uh, a deformity of the chest wall uh, early in uh, early in life and of course leads to decreased expansion of the chest wall uh, early in life independent of the extra bone add on top of that the extra bone that occurs after birth and you get a very toxic situation uh, where the joints in the spine are not formed properly the joints where the ribs join the spine are not formed properly and the chest wall doesn't expand properly as well in addition, this trippy faucet before birth causes malformations of other joints, uh, such as the hips, uh, to a less extent the knee. It causes the osteochondromas and the joint for, uh, malformations. And this was uh, studied extensively by uh, one of our graduate students recently in the last uh, two years, uh, Will Towler. Uh, Will got his PhD uh, with uh, Eileen uh, and studied the uh, the mal how the ACVR1 mutation not only causes heterotopic bone formation, but causes malformation of many, many joints in the body, not just the toes, which we see, but many other joints as well. And it'll be interesting over time to see if medications that are developed for FOP uh, that can inhibit this uh, activity, the activity of this uh, drippy uh, uh, faucet or the exploding faucet, uh, can 
inhibit the jointed generation that we see uh, later in life in individuals with FOP, and that can lead to uh, a lot of the pathology um, that is common in FOP, not just the heterotopic lung formation. So back in 2015, uh, the scientists from, scientists from Regeneron and scientists from um, uh, Japan uh, made a very important discovery. The old school of thought said the faucet should be off when it's off, the normal faucet should be off, uh, and the bone morphogenic proteins turn it on and drip, 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 and uh, that causes bone to form when you want to make bone. Uh, they discovered, um, the scientists from Regeneron and from Japan, discovered that although BMPs turn it on, Activin turns the normal faucet off. That's a, that was a very interesting discovery. But what they discovered next was really even more interesting. And that was that the FOP, in the old school, we thought that there's a drip, drip, drippiness of the faucet and the bone morphogenetic proteins turn this faucet on. Uh, but what they discovered was that Activin A, Activin A, um, in the where it turns a normal faucet off, it turns the FOP faucet on. So it acts in the same direction as the BMPs. This was a really a controversial and uh, a very, uh, uh, it was a fascinating discovery because it said that a ligand, a hormone-like molecule like activin A acts one way on a normal receptor and a completely different way on, on the FOP receptor. And this led scientists uh, in Regeneron and in Japan to, um, to uh, do is uh, to wonder what the normal copy of the gene has. Now, in in healthy individuals, there are two normal copies of the gene. In FOP patients, there's one normal copy of the gene and one abnormal copy of the gene, one damaged copy of the gene. It's damaged by that one letter, and it suggests that what they see, what they suggested is that the normal copy turns the faucet off. And so, in an FOP setting, here's an FOP mouse. Uh, it has a mutant and a wild type gene, a normal gene, and they add active in A, and uh, you get extra bone. Now, here's a mouse that has the um, normal gene removed, and we see it, the green is, is representative of the bone formation, and we see an explosive amount of bone formation. So this, in fact, proved that the normal gene uh, that active in A acts on the on the um, healthy gene or the healthy copy of the gene to actually inhibit bone formation. So it's a bimodal switch. Uh, in FOP, it acts to um, to stimulate that switch, and the normal copy acts as a break. And so um, this actually established that that the uh, active in A acts on the normal gene one way and the FOP gene the other way. And this was published in a paper in 2018 in Nature Communications by John Lee Shepard and his colleagues, uh, and really was, a, was a, a fascinating discovery, an important discovery. The scientists from Regeneron uh, took a collagen sponge and implanted it with active in A, uh, and they got heterotopic bone. In a uh, non-FOP mouse, uh, there was no heterotopic bone. So we don't expect active in A to turn on that faucet in the normal context, and in fact, it does not. And this led to the uh, to the discovery that uh, an antibody to active in A prevents heterotopic ossification in FOP mice. So here's an FOP mouse that forms bone. Here's an FOP mouse uh, with with active in A that forms bone. Here's an FOP mouse with active in A treated with an antibody to active in A to sort of grab that hand that turns on the faucet. And so that faucet isn't turned on and the bone formation doesn't occur. So if you're a mouse with FOP, uh, we, have a, we have a treatment for you. Uh, we know that uh, um, um, humans are not mice. And um, uh, although this is a, a very, very uh, good um, model for drug discovery, uh, we know that humans are not mice. Now, in a human study, it showed that garatosumab, which is an active in A antibody, is an inhibitor of active in A, and it reduces the formation of heterotopic bone and soft tissue flare-ups in patients with FOP. And this was presented recently 
at the American Society for Bone and Mineral Research by uh, Dr. Maralisa Eckhoff. Uh, for all of us, uh, all of uh, the colleagues that participated in this study, all the patients and all the uh, uh, investigators that participated in this study. So there's a, a great deal of hope here, but there's also uh, some risk and uh, that will be presented later by the um, uh, by the scientists from uh, Regeneron uh, Corporation uh, who sponsored this study. So this is a very promising study uh, and you'll hear more about it later on. So the active NA antibody acts to uh, inhibit the action of active NA and prevent that faucet from turning on. And as one would expect with this, with this uh, model, that we would expect less, uh, less a SMAD 1.5 to come out of the faucet, which is a signal to form more bone. It basically turns the faucet off and there's less bone formation. Now turning, our, uh, uh, turning to a, a, the same grammar for drug discovery, but to a slightly different perspective, uh, let's look a little bit downstream. Back in, in the early 2000, uh, 2013, uh, Dr. Maurizio Pasifici from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and his colleagues published a paper, a very important paper in Nature Medicine that showed that potent inhibition of heterotopic ossification occurs by nuclear retinoic acid receptor gamma agonist. Now this is a mouthful. Basically this says that palaveratine, uh, palaveratine which is a, um, a retinoic acid gamma receptor agonist uh, inhibits heterotopic bone formation. In this cartoon, we see that that um, the muscle doesn't turn, the muscle tissue doesn't, uh, muscle cells don't turn into bone cells automatically, but it goes through a process that you have injury, inflammation, muscle destruction, uh, the muscle gets completely destroyed, you have tissue progenitor cells. If you went to the butcher shop and you looked at a, a steak, you would see the um, the uh, cells, the muscle cells, but you also see the cells, the tissue progenitor cells, which you don't see them, but they're there, and they're there in the connective tissue that supports the muscle. So mu muscle tissue is more than just muscle cells. It contains nerves and blood vessels and connective tissue, and it's within that connective tissue that those progenitor cells occur. Now, this is a very destructive phase, uh, of the FOB flare-up, and the very constructive phase, the anabolic phase, is heralded by tremendous fibro proliferation, tremendous formation of cartilage, and then that transformation of the cartilage into bone. That's what we call an endochondral bone formation pathway. That's how the bone, that's how bone forms. Uh, that's how our skeleton grows in length. That's how fractures heal, and that's how FOP bone forms. And it turns out that these retinoic receptor gamma agonists, of which palaveratine is, is, a, is one of those molecules, it inhibits the transformation from fibroproliferation to cartilage. And Dr. Pasifici and his colleagues showed this in a very important uh, paper uh, in Nature Medicine. And they went on to show, and, and uh, uh, they went on to show that using various concentrations of palaveratine, using a BMP implant model in wild type mice, they were able to uh, abrogate or lessen the amount of heterotopic bone formation in a mouse that had a mutation that's similar to FOP, but uh, we don't see in humans. It's one amino acid, one letter away from what we see in humans, but it gives a more uh, potent uh, phenotype, more potent um, uh, bone formation. We see that palaveratine uh, does inhibit the bone formation. And in the actual FOP mice, the conditional mice that have been developed uh, since Dr. Shores original discovery and that are used in the experimentation uh, for uh, different drugs. We find that uh, palaveratine doesn't completely abrogate the bone formation, but it decreases the bone formation. And this is also the basis for a clinical trial that palaveratine for FOP, um, uh, palaveratine for FOP decreases the amount of heterotopic obstigation. And again, you'll hear later on today from the uh, sponsors, uh, Ipsen and Clementia, uh, about this trial, what they found, what they didn't find, what the good points and what the bad points of the, uh, of, of, of the drug uh, are. 
And so we have here that paloverotene works downstream. It doesn't work on the BMPs. It doesn't work on active NA. It doesn't work on the faucet itself. I mean, perhaps some, but it, it, that, it's not, that's not its major effect. It works basically to inhibit the signal that comes out of the faucet from making bone, from making bone by interfering with that fibroproliferation to cartilage transformation, that scaffolding that's very important in making heterotopic bone. So in, we don't make bone directly in FOP. We make bone indirectly by cartilage, and that cartilage gets transformed into bone. So if drugs like paloverotene can inhibit that process, perhaps you can inhibit the formation of the bone. If you can inhibit the scaffolding, you can inhibit, hopefully, the formation of bone. So paloverotene doesn't act to stop the flare-up of FOP. It, it acts like an umbrella to uh, lessen the amount of bone. And we'll see that. We'll see the good points and the, um, the positive points and the negative points of that are presented by the sponsor. And we, now, we've known for years that the FOP faucet uh, that sorry that the uh, FOB gene does not turn a normal faucet into a raging faucet. The FOP gene turns a normal faucet into a drippy faucet, and that's what we see in embryogenesis. But something turns this faucet on. Something causes the BMPs and active in A, the 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 hands that turn on this faucet to be activated and to turn that faucet on. And through a number of experiments throughout the world by many different laboratories over the years, we found out, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but we found out that inflammation and hypoxia, low cellular oxygen to, uh, to cells, not just, to, not just the oxygen we breathe, but cellular hypoxia that's caused by inflammation uh, can uh, uh, turn on this faucet and cause it to explode. And this now is the, uh, this is the basis for many clinical trials and many off-target uh, uses of, of drugs to inhibit the inflammation and hypoxia, the devil here, from stabbing the, the hands, the uh, BMPs and active in A, to turn this faucet on. So we have the HIF1-alpha inhibitors like um, like imatinib, the mTOR inhibitors being studied uh, in Japan, the anti-inflammatory medications that we currently use to abrogate some of the symptoms of FOB. We can't use them uh, forever uh, because of their side effects and some immune suppressants uh, as well. It would be very interesting and very helpful to understand the, the, um, the actual molecules in the immune system so that we could target those more specifically uh, rather than turn the, the entire immune system off. We know from other individuals who've had bone marrow transplantations for other causes besides uh, FOP, who also had FOP, one individual in particular, and that if we turn off the entire immune system, we can turn off FOP, um, but that is extremely dangerous to do. So. Uh, there is a lot of research going on now to identify the inflammatory triggers of this so we can be more specific in inhibiting this. This show, is shown here as an action hero trying to inhibit the, uh, the inflammation and hypoxia from turning on the BMPs and active A and activating this faucet, uh, which, uh, which can explode. Now, a tremendous discovery was made by Dr. Goldhammer and his colleagues back uh, several years ago. And they discovered that multi, multipotent progenitors resident in the skeletal muscle uh, tissue uh, exhibit robust BMP-dependent, now we know active-independent, osteogenic activity, active and A-dependent, osteogenic activity, and mediate heterotopic ossification. So as I said before, skeletal muscle is more than just skeletal muscle. It's um, uh, skeletal muscle cells. It includes skeletal muscle cells, it includes blood vessels, it includes nerves, it includes uh, supporting tissues, it includes satellite cells that are responsible for actually regenerating a, a muscle. After you injure a muscle, a healthy individual injures a muscle and that muscle gets regenerated, uh, it's done by the satellite cells. But uh, what Dr. Goldhammer and his colleagues found is that these 
fat cells, these fibroadipogenic progenitor cells, and that's a mouthful. These are cells that uh, act as scaffolds. They, uh, they're like conductors to the orchestra. They don't make any sound necessarily, but they conduct the entire orchestra and they allow the muscle to regenerate. In a sense, they're like a scaffold, in a, not the same as cartilage is a scaffold, but they're, they're a scaffold in a sense, and they, uh, and they go away. They don't make the sound, they don't cause the, mu the normal muscle to regenerate, but they orchestrate the entire process. And these fibroadipogenic progenitor cells, we now know from work by Dr. Goldhammer and his colleagues, uh, that when they contain the uh, FOB gene mutation, they actually can contribute to uh, extra bone. These are the cells that actually form extra bone. So your, your brain cells don't, your spleen cells don't, your lung cells don't. It's cells in the muscles, these cells in the muscles that do. Now, perhaps there's other cells, perhaps a, a cell similar to this in tendon and ligament and fascia and other connective tissue do. Uh, different uh, um, progenitor cells are probably responsible for the actions of the uh, drippy faucet uh, acting to not form the uh, uh, joints properly. And this was uh, this was discovered by Will Taller and will be published later this year. But we now know that these fibroadipogenic progenitor cells in the muscle uh, are the um, are the orchestrators of extra bone formation uh, in FOP at least in the muscle. And these cells, these F fat cells for short, uh, have a particular signature. They express certain proteins on their cell membrane, such as SCA1, PGZF, receptor alpha, TI2, MX1. Uh, and these cells, these cells are actually responsible. So it's not the muscle cells themselves. It's not the blood vessel cells. It's not the nerve cells. It's not the satellite cells. It's these other cells that are not killed in the process of inflammation that uh, from which we see the explosion of fibroadipogenic, uh, the, the explosion of these cells become fibroadipogenic cells and then cartilage cells, and then they get transformed into bone cells. Um, these fat cells. Now, our body consists of trillions of cells. And let's imagine uh, that there's a room, let's call it a bathroom. Um, uh, and the, the bathroom represents the fibroadipogenic progenitor cell. Now these cells are, are complex cells. They have many different receptors. They have receptor, they have the ALK2 receptor, which is ACVR1, that's another name for the, uh, ALK, for the uh, ACVR1 receptor is ALK2. Uh, and that, uh, that's the leaky faucet uh, in the sink. But there's another receptor that looks very, very similar uh, and that works the toilet. And another receptor that's very similar that works the shower. And another receptor that's very similar that works the bathtub, in the bathtub. And these are ALK3, ALK1, and ALK6. So we want, uh, we want a drug that turns off the leaky faucet but doesn't turn off the, uh, the toilet, doesn't turn off the shower, and doesn't turn off the bathtub. Now we're... At, from Harvard University, from Paul Yu and Ken Block and their colleagues, uh, Dr. Charles Hong, uh, who's now at Vanderbilt, this, uh, now at uh, University of Maryland, he was at Vanderbilt, uh, and he named dorsomorphin. Uh, this, they discovered this uh, protein uh, just before the FOB gene was discovered. And when the FOB gene was discovered, they realized that perhaps there is a, uh, we, have a we have a drug. Uh, the reason they developed this molecule was uh, as a tool for understanding other, other processes that are caused by abnormalities of the of BMP pathway. Um, and they studied dorsomorphin and in, in, it inhibits ALK2. It also inhibits ALK3 and ALK6. So while this is good for, for mice with FOP, it might be good for mice with FOP and inhibits the bone formation, it wouldn't be good for humans because it inhibits multiple, multiple receptors. Now, over the years, the various pharmaceutical companies, um, and I've, I've listed them here, uh, AstraZeneca, BioChrist, uh, Blueprint, Insight, Kiros, have, have uh, developed molecules. They, they work assiduously very hard to develop molecules that block the ALK2 receptor preferentially, the uh, FOP receptor, and uh, the leaky faucet, and not the other faucets 
that are very similar. And uh, here we just have blue 7A2, uh, the blueprint molecule, uh, which uh, is more specific for ALK2 than some of the other receptors. It's not it's not entirely specific, but it's more specific. And you'll hear more about that later today uh, from Ipsen and, and Blueprint. Uh, this is a this is a uh, uh, a diagram done by Jay Grappi. It shows computational docking of the ALK2 inhibitor dorsomorphin, um, which is a non-specific inhibitor. Uh, the green is the uh, is the faucet is the leaky is is the uh, is ACVR1 and this is the leaky part of the faucet. Um, the, uh, this is the well, this is the normal molecule, so it's not leaky. This is the normal faucet, and this is where uh, the water comes out. The uh, PSMAD15 that signals the bone formation to occur, and this shows that molecules like dorsomorphin. Now we have more specific molecules made by AstraZeneca that's uh, now repurposed, that's going to be in the stop FOP trial. Um, Insight, Kiros, Biochrist, um, uh, and Blueprint uh, that uh, fit into this uh, part of the molecule and uh, stop that water from coming out. So in a sense, uh, we have we have uh, five different drug companies now that have been working assiduously to find or develop, uh, or both, uh, molecules that more specifically inhibit the leaky faucet and not other faucets that are similar. Because we don't want to turn off the water in all these other systems. We simply want to turn off that leaky faucet. And I've uh, shown that here metaphorically. Uh, those drugs basically work on the faucet itself. So they don't work on the hand, hands that turn on the faucet. Uh, they work on the faucet itself by acting as little plugs. You can envision that, that screw into the faucet, that fit into the faucet, and inhibit the, that water from coming out, that leakiness and that exploding water from coming out so that there's no heterotopic bone. Again, the FOB gene is the, uh, it becomes the central target and uh, uh, it, it establishes the, uh, the grammar for, for drug discovery. Here, uh, in a linear diagram, we've imagined this faucet now stretched out. And so here you see the entire FOP faucet. And uh, the R206H is where 97% of people with FOP have the mutation. But uh, people with variant, F variant FOP, um, non-classic FOP, who have variant mutations, have mutations at other points in this faucet, um, uh, very, very close to where the, uh, where the FOB, the common FOP mutation is. And this is represented in the next slide that we think that these FOP variants uh, are, these FOP variants are sort of de described here where the normal uh, sorry, the, the classic FOB mutation occurs here, and we think that drugs, most drugs that are used for for the classic FOP uh, that are tried for classic FOP will be helpful for those who have variant FOP as well. Um, they basically uh, are, are antibodies that uh, prevent the hand from turning on the faucet, maybe turning on the uh, uh, antibodies against the, the handle itself, um, plugs in the faucet, and they'll, they should all um, be effective, uh, we, we think, uh, theoretically, in both the classic mutation and in the variant mutation. So this is a very exciting time, not just for patients who have classic FOB, but also those who have, who have variations. Now here I've shown on this slide the entire cascade, the, that entire grammar. So the FOB faucet is here, that's the leaky faucet. Uh, the gene mutation is here. We have uh, antibodies against active A that actually bind active A and prevent it, and prevent that hand from turning that faucet on. Again, active A turns the normal faucet off, but it turns the FOP faucet on. And um, there is a Japanese company that's working called Daiichi, uh, uh, Daiichi Pharmaceuticals that's working on antibodies based on Dr. Katagiri's work. Uh, developing antibodies against 
the uh, receptor itself. So antibody is not against the hand that turns on the faucet, but against the handle that turn that faucet is that uh, the handle of the faucet itself. So that's another approach upstream. We have these uh, uh, signal transduction inhibitors or out to specific uh, drugs. These are oral drugs. The antibodies are not oral. They're a protein molecules, so they have to be delivered intravenously. The um, the small molecules, the little plugs that fit into the faucet, uh, will be absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract and be, can be taken orally. And we hope that they uh, inhibit this PSMAD8, this signal from coming out of the faucet and simulating uh, bone formation. We have the uh, inhibitors to bone formation, uh, inhib inhibitors of inflammation, rather, uh, and hypoxia, like hip point alpha inhibitors, mTOR inhibitors, and inflammatory inflammatory medications, immune suppressants, and hopefully more specific molecules in the future that uh, that devil that stabs the hand, uh, the active in A hand and the BMP hand that turn that faucet on. And we have a palaveratine that acts downstream as an umbrella to prevent this signal from getting to the cells to stimulate new bone formation. So this is, uh, this is the metaphor. Uh, and we see that the FOB gene is central to that. But there are upstream targets, there are onstream targets, there are downstream targets, and there are sidestream targets for this. And the more we learn, the more research that's done to understand how this system works, how these, how this, how this central grammar of drug discovery works, or how this central grammar of of activation occurs, uh, and how the the sidestream activation of inflammation occurs, the more and better able we will be to, to develop drugs uh, for FOP. Now, this is a pathway. This is an ancient, ancient pathway of 500 million years or more that's been there in the animal kingdom. And so it's not going to be easy and not necessarily easy to, uh, um, to inhibit this pathway without any side effects. And that's important. That's important to keep in mind. Now I looked up the word cure because that's in our in our mission statement. And the word cure says to make someone healthy again or to cause an illness to go away. And essentially the way we we can conceive of curing FOP is um, is perhaps with some form of gene therapy. Um, soon after Dr. Shore and I and our colleagues discovered the FOP gene in 2006, we realized that uh, the ultimate treatment for FOB might be to correct that gene. We didn't know what cells are involved. We now have a better idea, not a complete idea, but a better idea of the cells that are involved. And so we don't want to target all the cells in the body, but we would want to target some of the cells in the body, those specifically responsible for forming extra bone, like those fibroadipogenic progenitor cells. We certainly don't want to target all the, all the uh, faucets in that cell, in those cells, and because that will uh, affect, cause other side effects. Those affect other processes. Um, so we we want some, you know, we want some technology that's able to correct the gene defect in just the cells we want to. And gene therapy is a large term. It uh, it entails many different possible processes. We published a paper uh, some years ago. Uh, looking at inhibitory RNA. It's a type of gene therapy, uh, sort of inhibiting the uh, activity of the of the gene through in inhibitory RNA, basically at the factory level, uh, uh, so that the factory doesn't make abnormal faucets. But there are other types of gene therapy as well, where we actually correct the genes. Now, the current technology for correcting uh, genes is uh, by introducing uh, uh, introducing the machinery to correct those genes by using a virus. We know that virus, certain viruses trigger FOB. So we certainly don't want the fire department going in and setting fires while they're trying to put them out. Um, we don't want plumbers coming in and causing leaks when they're trying to repair a leak. So this is the proper time for the FOB community to uh, begin to investigate gene therapy. Uh, I have no doubt that um, 
that there will probably be uh, certain successes in animal models. But as we, as I said before, and as we know, uh, FOB mice, FOB individuals are not FOB mice. FOB mice are not FOB individuals. So it may be possible in the FOB mice as a proof of concept, but I want to state very clearly that it will be some time, a long time, perhaps before gene therapy comes to the clinic. This is not replaced. This is the right time to investigate gene therapy, but it will not replace, uh, and it should not replace, um, uh, the uh, current, uh, uh, the, the, the drugs that hopefully will be rolled out for clinical trials that are currently being rolled out and that will be rolled out. So this is for the long term. A journey of a thousand miles, as the old proverb says, begins with a single step. And I think it's the right time to investigate gene therapy. Um, and I, I applaud the community for doing that. Um, but I want to say to the families that gene therapy is not on the horizon for next year, or the year after, or the year after. It's way down the line. Hopefully, there will be some breakthroughs, and it'll be sooner, uh, if possible. But but certainly is it is a time to investigate this correct in other words correcting the gene so here i have uh, the central target of gene therapy uh, a central target of fop uh, therapy uh, is the fob gene um, and it's shown here in the box ac one r 2 f 6 h um, these are the targets listed here as we know them today and these are the potential treatments so we have soft tissue injury or spontaneous flare-ups, which lead to inflammation and tissue epoxia, which activate BMP4 and active in A, which um, act on the FOB gene, turn on that faucet, cause that, uh, that signal to come out that forms heterotopic bone, that forms extra bone. So what are the potential treatments? Well, we can prevent injury. That, will, that may stop some of the FOB flare-ups, but it won't stop all of them. Immunosuppression. Um, as a concept, uh, sounds okay, but it's a very, uh, it can be very, very dangerous to turn off the entire immune system. So we want to discover, and that's what the laboratory is for, we want to discover more specific inhibitors, more specific ways to inhibit not, not just the entire immune system, but the part of the immune system that causes FOP flare-ups. Um, anti-inflammatory drugs, mast cell inhibitors that inhibit inflammation, perhaps uh, HIF-1-alpha inhibitors, uh, mTOR inhibitors that can inhibit tissue epoxia, monoclonal antibodies against active A, which you'll hear more about today, um, uh, and BMP4, especially active A, that can inhibit the uh, extra bone formation. Signal transduction inhibitors that I mentioned that are coming down the line in the STOPFOP trial from Blueprint, from Insight, from Kiros, from BioCrisp, from Ipsen, um, uh, that can, the little plugs that fit into the FOB gene itself. Uh, now downstream, we have palivaritine. We're gonna hear more about that today uh, to inhibit the heterotopic endochondral ossification. And perhaps combinations of drugs that allow us to inhibit this, or combinations of therapies that allow us to inhibit this entire process that will allow us to remove a bone, extra bone, heterotopic bone that's already formed uh, without simulating new bone formation. So this is our hope for the future. Last year, the Philadelphia Inquirer published an article uh, in its paper. It said drug therapies in sight. They're not here yet. They're on the horizon for bone forming diseases. And the subtitle is how a 2016 discovery made an obscure condition a worldwide enterprise. So this is uh, the FOB gene discovery was uh, the most important uh, discovery in the FOP community in the last several hundred years. And it established not just the central cause of FOP, but as I hope I've shown you, the central uh, catechism, the central grammar for drug discovery for FOP that we now have, and hopefully 
we'll have many more targets and many more possible therapies in the future. Some of you have uh, Google alerts like I do, uh, and so you uh, hear and you see and you're alerted to uh, anything about the FOP community that's in the news media. And uh, just about every day I get a report from the uh, pharmaceutical community that says uh, FOP drug market uh, expected um, a massive growth by 2020 to 2028. And another article that was published showing that FOP treatment market is projected to grow massively in the near future. So there's going to be many, many more possibilities, hopefully, in the near future as various pharmaceutical companies and laboratories discover uh, new targets and new, tre uh, new possible uh, uh, ways to inhibit those targets in FOP. Some will be upstream, some will be onstream, some will be downstream, and some will be sidestream. But they all, as we currently conceive it, uh, and perhaps there are some surprises in the future, and uh, that's what research is. Like, like I said in Hamlet, uh, there are more things in heaven and earth or ratio than are accounted for in your philosophy. So it's possible that there will be some other uh, and new surprises down the road that uh, in, that enable us to expand this this uh, this grammar. And this is an important slide. It sh basically shows a, an individual here. Let's call him an FOP, uh, a patient, uh, someone who has FOP, balancing the good points of a drug versus the bad points of a drug. What are our goals? Our goals to stop flare-ups, to prevent flare-ups, to maintain function, to slow joint degeneration that's caused by this trivia faucet. We don't know if we can do that. <clears throat> Hopefully over time, we'll be able to do that with, uh, with various drugs and change the natural history of the condition. We hope that eventually there will be uh, drugs and combinations of drugs that we can use in different individuals to basically stop this process so we can remove bone that's already formed and uh, liberate joints that are, that are currently locked up with FOB. Um, wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it be nice if we, if we could do that uh, and turn FOP from a, a nightmare disease into something more than, uh, an in, than, than an inconvenience, something not more than an inconvenience. But there are side effects of drugs. And you'll hear some of those today uh, from the pharmaceutical companies. Every drug has side effects. Every drug has off-target effects. There are, you, you want to target the, the target that you want, but there, there are collateral effects as well. And, uh, and some of those are tolerable and some of those may not be tolerable. Some of those are predictable and some may not be predictable. And um, unfortunately, um, uh, our, our, we can use animal models to predict what the outcome will be. We can use phase one trials in healthy individuals to indicate what some of those side effects will be, but we don't know for sure until we test these drugs out in individuals who have FOP. So it's a, it's a, you know, individuals who participate in clinical trials are very courageous um, and they're pioneers. They're pioneers. And basically they're pioneers because unless we have clinical trials, we will not know if drugs are effective in treating FOP. But entering into those clinical trials, we have to recognize that every drug has side effects, every drug has off-target effects. There will be allergies. Some patients will have allergies to certain drugs. Certain individuals will not respond to certain drugs. Uh, there may be a rebound effect in some individuals where if you stop a drug, you get a rebound effect. The, it's like a NAM. We know that, and you, a lot of you have seen that with, uh, with the steroids, with prednisone. When you stop the prednisone, the inflammation comes back even more intense than before in some uh, uh, situations. Some individuals may develop resistance to drugs um, where a drug is effective for a period of time and then they develop resistance. They may have compliance. Um, it may be difficult to take certain drugs. They may not, it may not be clear how, to, uh, how a drug should be taken. Uh, certain individuals won't be able to tolerate drugs, certain drugs. Uh, there may be access in, uh, um, uh, 
issues and there may be cost issues also with certain drugs. So these are some of the negative effects that we'll have to deal with. Um, and But I, I would say let there be no mistake, clinical trials are not treatments. They are imbued with hope um, and, they're in, and they're our only path to hope, but they're fraught with, with some tribulation and some risk. And we can never forget that and that should be and that will be highlighted later um, in in some of the talks that you that you see but hope if, if there's one thing to take away from this talk it's hope we do have hope we have hope for the future and we have hope because we have a target we have targets we have a grammar we have a an entire pharmaceutical industry that's committed to developing drugs that are specific and helpful for FOP patients. We all want to see, we all want to see this be successful. Everybody in the world, um, we want to see that the scales are tipped very far in the in the direction of 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 helpful, not harmful. But we want to proceed very very cautiously with clinical trials. Our a patient of mine from Canada, Adam Bigris, said. Many years ago, he said, thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Thank you for seeing me at the hospital. I had fun on the tour. I liked the ice cream. I didn't like the needle. Hope to see you again. Please help fix my FOP. And we return again to the New York Times article. It says, finally, with genetic discovery, hope, hope for escape from a prison of bone. Hope. It's hope. And one of my patients, Ian Kelly, said, with the FOP gene discovery, we went, we went from hopeless to hopeful. And Yakamboa, one of my patients from Pueblo, Mexico, is now a physician, said we need hope, and if we have hope, we'll be okay. I just want to say that um, there will be obstacles along the path, but as a, a United States senator said, obstacles along the path are not obstacles, they are the path, and um, we will get there. We will have hope. Uh, we have to proceed cautiously. Um, obstacles along the path are not obstacles. They are the path. Uh, I've shown here our FOP team at the University of Pennsylvania. There are many, many other teams around the world and other centers around the world. When I go to bed at night, uh, when I went to bed at night for many years, uh, the next day we continued where we left off the night before. Now. FOP is a worldwide enterprise. It's no longer the backwaters of medicine. It's now the mainstream. And uh, there are teams around the world working around the clock. So even as, as each of us sleeps, uh, there are teams around the world working on uh, treatments, cures, uh, ways to bring better hope, more hope, uh, essential hope to the FOP community. So it's one team, one mission, and this is true around the world. Um, a lot of a lot of the slides that I presented today uh, will be featured in the next annual report, the 28th uh, annual report of the FOP Collaborative Research Project, which uh, hopefully will be published soon. And uh, you'll see those, so you'll have, have another chance to to read about that and to understand that. We uh, also understand that that uh, these this central grammar for drug discovery is for the future. It's our near horizon, but um, currently we have symptomatic treatments and they're laid out in the medical guidelines for FOP, the medical management of FOP, current treatment considerations, or what's commonly known as the FOP treatment guidelines, which are used around the world and have been developed by the International Clinical Council, which is uh, seven, which comprises uh, 21 individuals uh, from around the world who are expert clinicians in the treatment of FOB. So these are not uh, these are not dictations, dictates, but guidelines for, for treatment. And every FOP patient, every FOP family, uh, every FOP uh, physician around the world who treats a, a patient with FOB should be familiar with those guidelines and can reach out to any member of the ICC for help. Uh, I want to acknowledge the International FOP Association, the friends and family of FOP patients worldwide that have supported research. I've at the Isaac and Rose Nassau Professorship, the Ian Kelly 
professorship at Whitney Weldon, the Ashley Martucci uh, Research Fund, the McGuire FOB Research Fund, the Gary White Research Fund, and many, many uh, communities around the world, associations around the world, um, and of course the National Institutes of Health that have um, helped us and helped others as well as we as we go on to uh, to understand these maps and what they mean for the FOP community and fill them in and bring hope to the FOP patients around the world. That's our central mission and that's what we hope to accomplish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan, for sharing that wonderful metaphor and for laying a foundation to help us understand some of the presentations we'll hear about in the FOP clinical trial sessions later today. Any questions for doc Dr. Kaplan will be addressed during the Common Health Questions for FOP Medical Experts panel at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 1500 GMT. We hope to see you all there.